Wormwood, I'm delighted to hear that your patient's race and profession make it possible, but not necessarily certain, that he will be directly attacked by either protesters or law enforcement. We want to keep him in the maximum uncertainty so that his mind is filled with contradictory pictures of the future, each one arousing either hope or fear. There is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human mind against the enemy. He wants people to be concerned with what they do. We want them to be concerned with what will happen to them. Your patient will, of course, have picked up the idea that he should submit with patience to the enemy's will. What the enemy means by this is that he should accept with patience the actual tribulation dealt out to him, this present anxiety and suspense. It is about this that he is to say, thy will be done, and for the daily task of bearing this that the daily bread will be provided. It is your business to make sure the patient never thinks of the present fear as his appointed cross, only those things he is afraid of. Let him think of them all as his potential crosses, and let him try to practice fortitude and patience towards all of them at once in advance. Real resignation, in the same moment, to a dozen different and hypothetical fates is almost impossible, and the enemy does not greatly help those who are trying to attain it. Resignation to present and actual suffering, even when that suffering consists of fear, is much easier, and the enemy does help them. An important spiritual law is involved here. I have explained that you can weaken his prayers by moving his attention from the enemy himself to his states of mind about the enemy. Fear is easier to master if you can move his attention from the thing feared to the fear itself, when he views the fear as an unwanted state of his own mind, and if he thinks of the fear as his appointed cross, he will inevitably think of it as a state of his mind. One can therefore formulate the general rule. In all activities of mind which favor our cause, let the patient be unselfconscious and focus on the object. But in all states of mind which favor the enemy, let the mind bend back in on itself. Let an insult or a woman's body so fix his attention outwards that he does not reflect, I am now experiencing anger or lust. On the other hand, let the reflection, my feelings are growing more devout, so fix his attention inwards that he does not look beyond himself to see our enemy or his own neighbors. As regards his general attitude toward the conflict, I would not rely so much on those feelings of hatred which the humans are so fond of discussing in the media. In his anguish, he may be encouraged to revenge himself by some vindictive feelings towards abstractions of law enforcement or even the government. And that's good so far as it goes, but it will generally be a melodramatic or mythical hatred directed towards imagined scapegoats. He's never actually met any of these people. They are clay figures modeled on what he gets from Facebook. This sort of fanciful hatred is often very disappointing, and humans are in this respect completely useless. They are the miserable sort of creatures who will loudly proclaim the faults of an abstract institution, but then invite to lunch the first actual policeman they encounter. Whatever you do, there's going to be some kindness, as well as some hate, in your patient's soul. The great thing is to move the hate to his immediate neighbors whom he meets every day, and to move the kindness out to people he does not know. That makes the hate wholly real, and the kindness largely imaginary. There is no good at all in inflaming his hatred of authority if, at the same time, an awful habit of loving kindness is growing up between him and his mother, his employer, or the man he meets in the train. Think of your man as a series of concentric circles. His will on the inside, next his mind, and finally his fantasies. You cannot hope to exclude from all the circles everything that smells of the enemy, but you must keep shoving towards the outside all of the virtues until they are finally located in the circle of the fantasies, and you must keep drawing towards the center into his will all of those desirable qualities. It is only insofar as they reach the will and are become habits that any virtues are really fatal to us. I do not, of course, mean what the patient mistakes for his will, the conscious fume and fret of resolutions and clenched teeth, but the real center, what the enemy calls the heart. All sorts of virtues painted in fantasies or approved by his mind, or even, in some respect, loved and admired, do not keep a patient from our father's house. In fact, they make him more amusing when he gets here. 